Reading Genesis chapter 19 and the first 17 verses. And there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot, and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them, and shut the door after him, and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters, which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, Bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. But therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came into Sir John, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, Bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the morning arose, Then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of this city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth, and set him without the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And we all know what happened then to Sodom and Gomorrah, that fire rained on them from heaven. And indeed, that's why we have, a, we have actually an everlasting memorial to that, don't we? We've got the Dead Sea, which some of you uh, may have, have even swum in, as I have, and the extraordinary south, south assaults that are one assumes the remains of the sulphur, burning sulphur that rained down from heaven. Well, I was reading an email yesterday, it was an email or a text message that I was sent um, to pray for a UKIP counsellor, a Mr. Sylvester. Uh, he had um, been on the news, indeed I turned to the BBC News website and I read from it. Mr. Sylvester from Henley on Thames in Oxfordshire um, defected from the Tories in protest at David Cameron's support for same-sex unions. In the letter to the Henley Standard he wrote, the scriptures make it abundantly clear that a Christian nation that abandons its faith and acts contrary to the gospel and in naked breach of a coronation oath will be beset by natural disasters such as storms, disease, pestilence and war. He added, I wrote to David Cameron in April 2012 to warn him that disasters would accompany the passage of his same-sex marriage bill. 
But he went ahead, despite a 600,000 signature petition by concerned Christians and more than half of his own parliamentary party, saying that he should not do so. Well, he blamed the floods, recent floods, on that decision. Who knows whether he was right? I must admit, I hadn't made that equation myself. However, the Lord warns us himself um, of a coming judgment. He reminds us that the times of Lot will be present again in our age, as he reminds us of the time of Noah, when there was a flood because of the wickedness of humankind. This is what the Lord Jesus says in Luke chapter 17, verse 28. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Well, we should make it clear that homosexuality is a, it's a grievous sin, but it's not the only sin. We are in a state of rebellion against God. When we turn away from Him, we're all born in sin. The Bible says that. Uh, David, speaking in Psalm 51, says, says that I was born in iniquity. Friends, we are born with sin in our hearts. We don't have to be taught how to be naughty. At least I didn't have to be taught how to be naughty. And I suspect the same is true of all of us here. Because that's what the Bible says. We have an inbuilt propensity to do the wrong thing because we are the fruit of, the fruit of Adam's seed. And Adam having turned away from God, was cut off from God and left to die as a mortal human being. And yet even then, in those days, God spoke of a coming Redeemer. But just to reinforce that point, that we are all under the judgment of God because of sin. This is what we read in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. I don't think any of us could hold our hands up and say, well, because I haven't been guilty of this or that particular sin, therefore I am free from the judgment of God. Friends, the judgment of God will come upon all of us for any sin that we have committed. And there is a coming storm which is going to be far greater than any of the storms that we have faced in our country, that other countries have faced, or that was faced at the time of Noah, or in the days of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. This is what we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. For uh, from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols, to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Friends, there is a terrible wrath to come. We haven't yet reached it. The, uh, Peter speaks in his second letter uh, of a time when um, the earth will be destroyed by fire. The book of Revelation speaks about a lake of fire that all will be thrown into who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, where they will suffer agonies forever and ever. Friends, these are real threats to us all. And threats that the Bible makes alive to us so that we might respond 
as indeed all of us should respond to the wonderful gift of life that there is in Jesus Christ by turning away from our sins, repenting and turning and putting our trust in Christ that he paid the price when he died on the cross on Calvary. Well, for Lot, the, the coming judgment that was to befall just the next day had a terrible edge to it. He had first-hand experience of the wickedness of the people of that city. It wouldn't have been the only reason that that city was destroyed, but might have been the straw that broke the camel's back. And I think the same must be true in this country, that homosexual marriage is a wicked thing, because it flies in the face of God's commandments. But it's, in a sense, just the it may not even be the far end we may not have reached the end of our journey on this front but ever since homosexuality was decriminalised it has been from then on a steady downward spiral I'm not saying whether or not it should be decriminalised the act of decriminalisation is in one sense neutral but it seems to have led to an encouragement of a sin against God but it's, as we've said it's not the only one it's one above it's one of, uh, among many but Lot had first hand experience of it in that city it had got to a terrible stage a far worse stage in fact than it's reached in our nation so that men were roaming around that city looking for men to rape that is what we see here. Well, he also saw the astonishing answer of these angels who responded to the demands of these people by striking them blind. <coughs> Yet, despite being struck blind, isn't it extraordinary that these people continued to try and indulge in their lusts? Well, I think we have to acknowledge what a terrible grip sin has on us. We might even be suffering the consequences of our sin. As indeed, those men of Sodom, they had a foretaste of what would happen the next day. They were made blind. And yet, what was the consequence of this physical affliction upon them? It was for them to continue in sin. And it seems to me to be a tragedy that when sin is rewarded by its obvious fruits of failing health, which is the inevitable consequence, sometimes death itself, yet it's so easy in our human condition to continue in it, despite the fact we may be even suffering from the very consequences of the sin we yet still desire to indulge in it just as these men did and hastened the coming judgment upon them what if instead when they were turned blind instead of trying to still find their way to the door they cried out to those same angels in mercy we don't know what the response might have been it might have been so very different but for them it wasn't. And so, having endured blindness that night, they were to endure the fires from heaven the next day. Sometimes, friends, when we are struck by sickness as a result of our wrongdoing, it can be a mercy from God. It seems just a judgment, perhaps. Or maybe it just seems like one of those things that happens, that I was unlucky. But there's another way of looking at it. It's God's warning to us that actually he wants to prevent us from suffering something worse than this particular affliction might be causing us. And isn't that true, friends, that what faces all of us at the end of our lives is a judgment before the throne of God. And he has the power to throw soul and body into hell or to admit us into the kingdom of his son 
Friends, it isn't really a choice, is it? There's only one place that we will want to be. But it means making changes here on earth. Not waiting to that day and hoping that there might be room for you and me if we have continued in our sin because the Bible teaches that there won't be. Then it will be too late. But today is the day of salvation. Today is the day we must make our decision. And plainly there were those in Lot's house who did make the right decision. It seems from this passage that he had two daughters. I say it seems because it speaks of sons-in-law who were not living in the house. And when he spoke uh, to the men of, so uh, of Sodom, he said, Have my daughters, they've known no man. And so they can't be married. They, the answer might be, and seems to be, that they were engaged to be married. They were not yet married, so they were still living in their father's house with their parents, and the men were living elsewhere, but soon to be married to them. That seems to be the most likely scenario. The other answer is that, in fact, Lot had four daughters, and two of them were married, but we're not told about them. And so I'm going to assume for today, and I hope faithfully to the Bible, that, in fact, it is the former, that these were, there were only two daughters in Lot's household, and these two men were engaged to be married to them. And I just like to contrast the reactions of the two sets of people. You see, these daughters were faithful. They were faithful to their father. They had listened. They'd seen at first hand the consequences of dreadful sin. They themselves were in the most mortal danger, and it was the angels who protected them. Their hearts were softened to the call to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's really all about the heart, isn't it? One wonders whether the men, had they been there, inside the house at the time, might have had a different reaction when Lot went to see them. Because in the end, all they had was to trust the word of Lot. When Lot went over to see them and said, get out, come with us, we've been told to get out of the city, it's going to be destroyed by fire. And instead, we read that these men thought that Lot was mocking them. Maybe Lot had expressed concerns about them remaining in Sodom and Gomorrah and had suggested that they left and went to another city, perhaps because of the sin of that city, perhaps because of the job these people had. Whatever it is, they thought that Lot was mocking them. Friends, when we are told uncomfortable truths by people, and it's tempting for us to say, well, you're just making fun, you're not being serious, and anyway, even if you were, I wouldn't believe you. To look at the character of the person who's speaking to you. Because plainly had they done so with Lot, we know from what Peter said in his second letter that this was a just man. How many just and righteous men? They might pull your leg. That's different from openly mocking you. Openly trying to get you to do something ridiculous so that they might have the laugh the last laugh upon you. Just and righteous people don't do that. And yet, that is the pigeonhole that, they, that Lot was put in when he went to try and persuade Lot's uh, future sons-in-law to take a course that would have saved their lives, that would have meant that Lot would have had a proper family. Of course he didn't, because they didn't follow him, and his daughters had no one to marry. Well, we'll come on to that, we'll touch on that at the end. But it's worthwhile remembering the parable of the sower. And those who are likened to receiving the seed among thorns, so that they hear the word, 
But the cares of this word, world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. One wonders if Lot's sons had become so taken up with the thing, the course of the world and life in Sodom that they wouldn't have thought of leaving whatever the rest of their family were doing. They were rooted in this city because their whole lives depended upon it. And friends, the same can be true of us, can't it? Living in this city, London, that it can become everything to us and we may not be able to see life outside it. Certainly we might be able to go abroad and even move to the country, but the thought of leaving the lifestyle that London provides us can seem too onerous. And that we might be lulled into the false sense of security that London's been here thousands of years. Look, we've got some of the oldest buildings in the world here. And yet, as we've seen with the recent floods, buildings that have been unaffected for years suddenly find themselves underwater and people's um, possessions destroyed. Friends, there are certain warnings that we need to consider even if we haven't heard them from the first-hand source. We're reminded of Thomas. Thomas wasn't there when Jesus showed himself after his resurrection. And Thomas said, well, unless I put my hand in his side and my fingers in the holes of his hands, I'm not going to believe that he rose from the dead. And then Christ rebuked him when he appeared next and said, Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Lot's future sons-in-law hadn't seen what Lot's, what Lot's uh, household was subject to. And they wouldn't accept it from Lot. And friends, as a result, they, left, they lost their opportunity to be saved. But doesn't it also show us that we should make sure that our families are our first priority for our evangelism? That those we nearest and dearest to us must be those that we go to with the gospel. We're doing them no favours if we hold back. And yet it can be so difficult with our family. And we're not always going to get the reaction that we want. Well, we mustn't give up if we do get the wrong reaction. Friends, divisions can come at very close quarters for our families. Even in this case, between a fiancé, between two fiancés, assuming that that's the position that these daughters were in. One wonders at the terrible pain that those daughters must have gone through as they left the city, leaving those presumably that were dearest to their hearts behind to suffer the fate of that city. Friends, divisions are going to come even in our own families, amongst our nearest and dearest when it comes to the gospel. The Lord Jesus warned us of this in Mark chapter 13 verses 12 and 13 as he did in Matthew chapter 10 now the brother shall betray the brother to death and the father the son and children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake but he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved Friends, we're going to face opposition, even from our nearest and dearest. But that must not put us off following what we know to be true. Living life for the long term and not the short term. Lot's future sons-in-law were only concerned with the short term. In fact, only for that very night, if they'd known what was going to befall them the next day. So easy, isn't it, to take comfort from the things that are around us 
that seem to be permanent and to offer us support. But they don't actually, do they? Life is very insecure. The only security we can have is in Christ. And we must be loyal to the word of God and take the warnings of scripture, even if even our nearest and dearest reject them. We must pray for them. We must show our love for them by our actions, perhaps not always by our words, because there comes a time when your words fall on empty ears, deaf ears, but maybe by your actions they might yet be persuaded. Well, we should also, from this passage, take care who we choose as business partners, even close friends, or, as here, partners in marriage. Lot's daughters could, I think, be described properly as Christians if they were translated to the New Testament era. They were faithful to their father's faith, and he is described as just Lot, a man we would expect to find in heaven when we get there. They were willing to join him and leave the city, leaving behind all their dreams of the future that were bound up in these two men who were to have married them. Unlike their mother, they didn't have regrets, it seems. Their mother, though, was so different and so sad that we read in this few verses on in this chapter that she looked back and because she looked back she was turned to salt, a pillar of salt. Well friends that wasn't just to look back to see what the fires looked like. Because Abraham we see at the end of the chapter he was there and he saw it. We read at the end of Genesis 19 he looked back and he saw the fires, Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed. He wasn't turned to a pillar of salt. Friends but it's that look back in longing the Lord Jesus warns us. We've read in Luke 17. Beware of Lot's wife. Remember, sorry. Remember Lot's wife. Remember, friends, that we must not be those who, having set out to serve the Lord Jesus, look back and regret what we put behind us. Friends, it's so tempting, isn't it? to do that. But we are told um, that by the Lord himself, no man having put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. We read that in Luke chapter 9 verse 62. We mustn't be those who look back and long for what will destroy us as Lot's wife did and suffered appalling consequences. Lot's daughters didn't do that. They were willing at that stage anyway to put behind them the prospect of marriage. Marriage to the wrong people. Marriage to people that would bring them back into the slavery of sin. They put that behind them, friends. We need to be careful too, don't we? We are told in 2 Corinthians 6 verses 14 to 18, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion have light with darkness and what concord have Christ with Belial or what part have he that believeth with an infidel and what agreement have the temple of God with idols for ye are the temple of the living God as God hath said I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people Wherefore come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Friends, we must be careful who we share our lives with. Remember that God has a call on each of our lives. That call will come with it. Coming with that call will be that which you need to equip you for that call. For some, indeed, the majority 
it will be marriage. But friends, it's so easy to make a wrong choice, one of Satan's best ploys. I've heard it says, and although it's not in the Bible, there's some sense to it, always marry someone who is keener than you are. You see, just to marry a Christian is not always going to be the right answer for you because they may be called to a different calling to you. They may be pursuing a slightly different calling to the one God has placed on your heart. And while in many instances you might be able to reconcile those differences, it might be that there are still different differences that will be difficult to resolve. Friends, in all that we do, we need to seek God's plan and God's will for our lives. And he always answers in the most wonderful way because he puts peace in our hearts when we, ha- when we are in his will. It might be losing something that we greatly cherish in order to take that path. But I think that most, if not all Christians, would say having the peace of God in their hearts is better even losing the most valuable thing that this world might provide them. Because it would make sense, wouldn't it, that having God's approval in the end will satisfy more than having anything in the world that he's created which actually isn't his perfect will for you. Well, friends, we see it in a very obvious way in this passage. There are some decisions that end up being personal decisions that we make before the Lord. We can always say to somebody, do not marry a non-Christian. We can challenge someone not to marry a non-Christian. But when it comes, perhaps, to marrying someone who is a Christian and fulfills the biblical criteria, then when it comes to a matter of judgment, it is down to you to decide. And yet, even then, we must be looking at some of the spiritual principles, even that we see in this passage. Is there a difference that will become ever greater in the time to come. Do you have a special calling for the Lord that you know in your heart that you might be putting in second place to the course that you're taking? These are hard thoughts, friends. But they're ones that each of us will one day answer for on the day of judgment. And there's only one thing that God wants for us and that we should want for each other. And that is for us to be faithful, to live faithful lives to God, to do the work that he's called us to do, and to do it faithfully. So at the end of our lives, God can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We want that for each other, don't we? We should be praying for it, and always giving advice in the light of that aim. And that advice might well be marriage in many cases. applies to so many other aspects of marriage though, doesn't it? Where we live, what jobs we do, even where we go on holidays. The Christian walk is a daily walk. It applies to what we do even with an hour of our time. John Wesley used to divide his life up into five minute segments to buy up the day and Sometimes I think I should do the same because there seems always to be far too much to do in a day than physically seems possible and often physically than is possible. Friends, this passage is a hard passage for all of us and should bring challenges to us that we really seek God's will for our lives, that we remain faithful to the word that we've heard in the scriptures that we take heed of the warnings and we do the will of God ourselves and seek the will of God in others, that we warn those who are rejecting the path of Christ, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we warn them with tears and on our knees before God, but we don't let their disobedience in the end affect our obedience. The tragedy is that Lot's daughters didn't end up doing the right thing. We see it um, it, it, when we read on in Genesis that we just go back to the passage. Um, That 
once they'd left Sodom and Gomorrah, there was no prospect of these daughters getting married. And they did a terrible thing. They made their father drunk. And having made them made him drunk, they both slept with him. Friends, this passage, like many others, warns us what drink can do. What drink could do to a just man like Lot to make him have to be so blind drunk it would appear that he didn't know what he was doing. And he'd, before he knew it, he'd slept with both his daughters. And the seed from that wrong act were two nations that were set at enmity to Israel for generations to come. You can read about the Ammonites and the Moabites. They caused Israel so much trouble, all because of a wrong desire in these two daughters to have children at any cost. And secondly, it would seem their father's willingness to drink far more than was good for him. Friends, there's savouring warnings in this passage for us. Savouring warnings that can nevertheless be tempered with God's mercy that was shown to Lot, was shown to his daughters. Even his daughters weren't judged for this act and that Lot was still described as a just man. He wasn't a just man because of these things. But one can only assume that Lot repented. Friends, it's wonderful, isn't it, that we don't have to live condemned by our sin. God will forgive us. And we'll, we'll finish up with that, um, with that passage in 1, in 1 John chapter 2. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Friends, he is the propitiation for our sins. He has made peace for us with an angry God because of our sin. And Lord, and isn't it wonderful that he, by laying down his life, paid the ultimate price, but we don't have to pay it in eternity. We can be spared the flames of eternal, the eternal flames for which Sodom and Gomorrah are just a picture. And we might know that freedom from sin today, that peace of God in our hearts and that joy in our hearts. Friends, it's worth taking the narrow road wherever it leads us and to trust our futures in the hand of the Lord. He knows what's good for us far better than we know ourselves. Amen.